learn how important it is to play around with the numbers instead of thinking about them as rigid values. But there's one more idea I'd like to tell you about. Mathematical connections. One of the secrets that help those who do well in math is viewing this subject as connected, instead of thinking about its branches being isolated from each other. So we're going on a math tour to show you what I mean. Before I start, if there is anything that looks new to you, don't worry about it, because the goal is not to teach you these math concepts here, but rather show you how different branches are related. Do your best to follow along, because you might catch at least one interesting idea here that your school most likely didn't teach you. Let's start by looking at fractions, which is one of those topics that students love to hate. Fractions are also called ratios, or parts of a whole. A whole number is one that doesn't have any decimals, so 1, 2, 3, 5,000, and so on. However, 0.75 is not a whole number. In fact, it's only three parts of a whole number. Think of a pizza that was cut into four equal slices, and one of them was taken by someone. We're going to be left with three slices out of a total of four, which we write as three out of four to indicate exactly that. In this particular example, if we had the fourth slice available, so four out of four, we would say that the pizza was whole. And since we have just one pizza, we could replace this notation with just one instead of counting slices, but one is missing. We only have three-fourths of a pizza because someone ate a slice without permission. Now, back in school, you learned that some fractions are equivalent. If you don't remember what this means, well, let's go back to our pizza example. We got a new pizza and this time we decided to cut it into eight equal slices, instead of four. But then that same thief ate two slices of pizza this time. If we compare it to our original example, where three-fourths are left, it does look like we have the same exact final quantity available, even though counting the number of slices that are left versus the total number of slices that was initially available, our notation would say 6 out of 8 because we now have 6 slices left out of 8, the number required to consider the pizza whole. If we had all 8 slices available, we could replace this notation with just one pizza. So whether I have four slices and all four are still there, four out of four, or eight slices of pizza, eight out of eight, they're exactly the same and can be replaced by one pizza, provided that both pizzas are exactly the same size. Whether we have three out of four slices available or six out of eight slices available, they both represent the same exact part missing. So they're equivalent. They both can be written as 0.75 of a pizza. Now, in real life, I would probably never do it, but for the sake of our example, we could cut a third pizza into 16 slices instead. And what do you know? Someone just annihilated four slices in one swoop. Writing this down, would get 12 out of 16. But compared with the other two pizzas, the quantity is still the same. These three fractions, 3 out of 4, 6 out of 8, 12 out of 16, are said to be equivalent because they have the same relationship. We're just warming up here to make sure you're able to follow later. What's interesting is we can plot these fractions on a 2D graph. The top part, called the numerator, would be a point on the horizontal line, x, and the bottom of the fraction, the denominator, would be found on the vertical line, y. Looks like we can draw a straight line through the intersection points of each of our fractions and this line seems to have the same upward lift everywhere. This graph basically shows us how the numerator is related to the denominator, and since the slope is the same everywhere in the graph, we know that all three of our fractions are equivalent. That is, both the numerator and the denominator 
grow in the same exact proportions no matter how far we go on the X and Y axis. Now take another look at our graph. It seems I can draw three right angle triangles with a sloped line marking the hypotenuse. So we started off with fractions that represent slices of pizza, then plotted those fractions on a 2D graph and we ended up with right angle triangles all from the same starting point, but this is just the beginning of our journey. We're now going to explore an area of math where shapes transform into bigger, smaller, and move from one position to another while keeping the same initial relationship. Alright, let's look at our smallest triangle, the one represented by the 3 out of 4 fraction. We can dilate it by a scale factor of 2, which is just a fancy way of saying that we want to double each side in length and what do you know, we end up with our 6 8 triangle. I think you can predict what will happen if we dilate our 6 8 triangle by a factor of 2 now we'll get our 12-16 right angle triangle, which you also had on the 2D graph. Or we could have dilated our smallest triangle by 4 instead to transform it into our biggest example. This basically gives us another way to see the equivalency between our initial fractions. And that was transformational geometry without going into complicated terms. Where else do we use fractions in the real world besides slices of pizza or indicating parts of a whole? Driving cars. Those are special types of fractions that don't indicate parts of a whole, but rather how different units relate to each other. In other words, these fractions show the rate. Miles per hour, kilometers per hour, meters per second. Here we use a fraction to show how space, distance, which is represented by one unit, is related to time, represented by a different unit. And if we just go back to our 2D graph and our triangles, we see that the rate of change between our three fractions is 3 to 4. This is another reason why the slope line is straight and not curved in any way, which shows the three fractions are equivalent. This now brings us to the gates of algebra. It's the Summer Olympics and we want to see how fast Usain Bolt is running. We'll use the values from our fractions instead of the real ones, so it's easier to follow the relationship, which gives us something like this. In 3 seconds, he runs 4 meters, in 6 seconds, 8 meters, and in 12 seconds, 16 meters. Of course, these results aren't good enough for the Olympics, but they're fine for our tour. So we can graph these values where the x-axis represents the number of seconds and the y-axis holds the number of meters. When plotting, we see an identical graph to the one we saw before. Since we're interested to find out the rate, we're going to use this graph to write out an algebraic expression that represents the change in distance as time goes by. By the way, why do you think it's y equals 4 thirds of x and not 3 fourths of x? Write a comment in the discussion section. To find the rate easily, we can use our friend geometry to draw another right angle triangle representing just the change between the values, also called the slope triangle. I have to disclose something. The numbers we chose for these examples are also known as Pythagorean triples. Most of us know Pythagoras from his famous theorem, but not many were visually told what exactly it means, except an equation to use when you want to find out the length of a third side in a right triangle knowing what the other two are. But have you ever thought about how it came to be? How did Pythagoras formulate it? What does a squared plus b squared equals c squared actually mean? I'll show you right here. When studying right angle triangles, Pythagoras was playing around with different shapes and calculations. Then, after trying over and over and over again, he noticed a strange pattern. Pythagoras found out that when you extend two sides of a triangle to squares, 
and calculate the area for each, then you sum both of them together, it will equal the area of the square created using the hypotenuse always and for any right angle triangle. Now let that sink in for a minute. How do we find the area of a rectangle? We multiply the width by the length. How about when that rectangle is a square and both width and length are the same? We're essentially just raising one side to the power of two. To put it bluntly, the mysterious Pythagorean theorem is literally saying, take the area of the square created by the A side of the triangle and add it to the area of the square created by the B side of the triangle and the result will be the area of the square created by the hypotenuse, which in our example is the C side of the right angle triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And thanks to this relationship, we can now easily find out what size is the third side of the triangle if we know two of them, with the help of some basic math. Let's use our slope triangle as an example to find out the size of its hypotenuse, since we know the x side is 3 units and y side is 4 units. We draw a square on all three sides of the triangle. The x side square will have an area of 3 times 3, which is 9, and the y side square will have an area of 4 times 4, which is 16. Remembering Pythagoras' discovery, we know that if we add the two areas, we'll end up with the area for the hypotenuse square. So 9 plus 16, which gives us 25. Now all we need to do is take the square root of 25 to find out the length of one side of the hypotenuse square which is the hypotenuse itself. I mentioned that the numbers we picked are Pythagorean triples. He discovered a few combinations that are always equivalent regardless of the scale. Right angle triangles with the values 3, 4, 5, such as in our example, are known enough that if you see one with a side of 3 and another of 4, you automatically know the hypotenuse is 5. The same is true for 6, 8, 10, and 12, 16, 20. And we finally reached the end of this mathematical journey. I took you on this tour to show you interesting math connections that not many bother to teach us. What's more interesting is we stepped from number to geometry, to algebra, then back to geometry and number in just a few minutes, which is the equivalent of around 8 years of schooling. But everything I showed you here is linked to one key idea, mathematical proportions. No matter if we're talking about fractions, rates, or graphs, we're actually just showing proportions or relationships, but it's kind of hard to see this connection when going through many years of school. In fact, let me show you how we traveled on our journey through a context map. We began by talking about fractions. We made a table, we drew graphs. After this, we switched to geometry and transformational geometry, which brought us into the dilation territory. We went a few steps back and entered a different branch, which is algebra, and visualized what a slope is. All in the context of a single idea, proportions, relationships. This alone should show you how math is actually an interconnected subject instead of topics and rules that give you nightmares the nights before tests. Always look for mathematical connections and think outside the box. This will help you out when you encounter what seems an insurmountable problem. A global math test showed the students who achieved the lowest scores in math used the memorization strategy where they simply tried to remember as many rules as they could instead of focusing on mathematical connections. The highest achievers across the board proved to be those with a growth mindset who remembered th that math is a connected subject. This graph shows you the PISA results from 13 million students around 15 years of age in 34 countries. In this section, we talked about math reasoning, number flexibility, and mathematical connections. Now it's your turn. 
Use the discussion section to explain the most important ideas you learn here to someone your age, so that they would understand the impact this has on their success in math.